So the first thing that we do in our tradition is that we set our motivation. So if you can just take a moment. This kind of clears the mind from any kind of distractions, any kind of busy chatter that's going on and sort of gets us sort of recommitted to, you know, why am I here? And it can be a really, really simple thing. It can be really, really profound. But it's really important to always remember why we're doing what we're doing. So may this presentation that I'm about to give come from the heart of Manjushri, that it be clear and wise and beneficial, not only for my own mind, not only for the minds of those who hear it, but for all living beings throughout all of time. May we listen with clear minds, open hearts, May I be able to articulate truthfully and without error as much as possible those things that I understand about the Buddha's teachings and how I've integrated them in my life and how I have been inspired and have seen others integrate those teachings in their lives for the benefit of all living beings until we all reach the awakened state. So being my first presentation, this has been somewhat of a, a practice in attachment to reputation, <laughs> attachment to praise. Um, and I'm pretty much a tofu and broccoli kind of person. I'm not a scholar by any means. And so I ended up having to sit with these good practices, ancient and emerging, for about three weeks on my cushion before I could sort of figure out from my own side how I could really articulate how I see this. And um, and because I love analogies, and in the Catholic tradition, parables. When I was a Catholic, when I was a child, always used to just help me to understand things much more clearly than any type of theology. So um, I came up with an analogy to begin with that uh, Reverend Master Hank sure sort of um, alluded to yesterday is that. I came up with this conclusion that Shakyamuni Buddha was probably one of the most brilliant, astute environmentalists that we've ever had in our world. And at the time that he lived, the earth was not encumbered by humanity. I mean, she was really holding her own quite well, self-governing. The world wasn't populated by humans so much that she was really fighting with them. You know, that where the Buddha lived, there were these vast seas of jungle with these little tiny islands of civilization sort of connected with these ruddy roads with a lot of danger once you got off the road. So she was pretty much in control of the situation, and the world was quite wild at that time. So when he gave his teachings, there wasn't a lot of environmentalism in them. However, as we heard from uh, Ayatataya Loka, that what he did put together for the welfare and the the well-being of all living beings was the inner environmental field guide, which I would like to call the Four Noble Truths, the um, Eightfold Path, and in Mahayana Buddhism we call it the Three Higher Trainings. The Buddha using himself as his own field experiment through this, you know, the, the austerities, through spending a lot of time with the adepts and the yogis, learning deeper and deeper levels of concentration, reaching these subtler, subtler states of samadhi, he was able to really start removing and um, eliminating a lot of the pollutants that were in his mind. I mean, you have to remember that he came from this rather, this aristocracy, where he lived basically in the desire realm for the first 29 years of his life. He had a family that adored him. He had a wife who loved him, a child, consorts, everything that he wanted. So although he made this huge turn, after seeing the age, the sickness, and the death, and the sage, he had a lot of things that he still had to work on. And by going through these practices and then making a commitment sitting under that tree, he was confident enough that he had enough tools that he would sit there until all of that, all all those pollutions of greed, the hatred, whatever self-grasping ignorance that was still 
as subtle as it might have been at that point, were still in his mind, that he was going to remain in that position until that entire vast, limitless mind, whose qualities are clarity, awareness, luminosity, were revealed. It's not like it just sort of appeared out of nowhere. This vast, limitless mind is in all of us, and the Buddha was really hell-bent on sitting under that tree until he totally purified everything that was in the front of that and revealed it to himself. So that occurred. I mean, the, the field manual, he had been you know, observing, researching, analyzing, studying himself as an experiment for a number of years, and he put together this field manual, which, as I say, uh, Ayatataya Loka this morning displayed beautifully up on the PowerPoint. Um, and what happened is that when he got up from that state, totally awakened, past, present, and future simultaneously occurring, the arising, the abiding, and falling away of all phenomena clearly seen, compassion, uh, loving kindness, contentment, simplicity, wisdom just being illuminated by this mind, he stood up and said, they're never going to believe me. This is totally unexplainable to the world. How am I going to do this? And there was a point there where he could have certainly have just walked away and gone into his blissful nirvana forever and ever and not have ever had to dealt with what was going on and what he saw in the world. And from the story that they say, and I just heard this recently, that actually the celestial beings of the God realm, who are usually blissed out on their own realms, they came down and said, O Buddha, you know, do not abandon this world. There are beings who have little dust in their eyes. And they really need to. And so, out of this great compassion, he said, I'll give it a shot. And so for 40 odd years, he sort of, he taught this field manual. And as um, Tataya Luka said, there were some that had such little dust in their eyes that they fell off the tree as soon as he walked under it. And there were others that said, very nice, thank you very much, I've got to go shopping, and just, you know, left, leaving, of course, some power, powerful imprints in their minds. Um, so through this incredible compassion, we have this field manual of the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Three Higher Trainings, the practices of all of these wonder, wondrous virtuous qualities. And the people who were the most compelled that said, whatever you've got, I want, were the first monastics in Buddhism. And from then until 2,600 years now, that field manual has been purely transmitted from teacher to student, teacher to student, which I sometimes find, considering the state of the world right now, just mind-blowing, that it didn't get lost. It got close. There was a lot of decline. There was a lot of deterioration in cultures where it was. But it always managed to slip out under the dark of night and head across the sea to China, to Korea, to Sri Lanka. And now it has flown over the sea to the West. And we are the fortunate ones who through our own karma with the Dharma, who knows where that came from, we have made a commitment to be the lineage bearers of this field manual. And so now that we're in this 21st century, we've got to figure out, and of course the process as we also saw is long and in our you know, in our tradition, it takes countless lifetimes to make this field manual, memorize it, integrate it, live it as if it were your own. Is that how do we integrate this field manual into our communities? And by extension, how do we then manifest it in very, very practical, simple, innovative ways? And then how far do we go and how do we sort of express it in the world, just as he did. Because apparently, and I think some of us might have experienced this, that when we're really, really connected to the Dharma, and we go out into the world and we speak to people, they sense something different about us. It's not just the, the clothes. There's something else going on. There's this open-heartedness. There's this open-mindedness. There's this willingness to be transparent that people may not be able to describe, but they certainly experience. And so that is one of the beautiful uh, environmental practices that come as a result of practicing the Buddha's teachings is this transparency, 
this open-heartedness, this absolute joy in engaging whoever shows up in front of you. And that takes a lot of practice, a lot of discipline, a lot of courage. Because from what I've done a little bit of web searching is um, Michael Pollan of the New York Times, who had written a recent article called Why Bother? is that in our culture in particular, there is not only a crisis of lifestyle, but there's a crisis of character. <clears throat> and I've kind of narrowed it down to three things. I want when I want when I want it, which I think Judith beautifully said, I want all, I want all, and I want it now. We've got our same version. And the other one is, it's not my problem, it's not my fault. So those are the three malaise, I think, particularly of our Western culture. And I would, you know say that every one of us, no matter how long we've been ordained, it's getting maybe perhaps more and more subtler, but those conditioned cultural responses to the world are still embedded. And luckily for us, this field manual is just so profound and so like like Manjushri's sword. It can really, really do some serious um, cutting through of some of these grosser delusions and cravings. I think that our communities, by practicing right livelihood, speech, ethical discipline, creating harmony, cultivating compassion, I think in our communities is a grassroots movement at its very heart. And what I'm inspired about, and because I've been in training the past four years at the Abbey, I had no idea of what some of the other Buddhist monasteries were doing. So I got all excited when I got emails from Venerable Sona and from Abhayagiri and from Bob. And I was so excited because there's the external manifestation, the wanting to um, heal the environment on the outside, coming from the healed environment and the healing environment on the inside is really taking place in the American monastic communities, really quite uh, profoundly and really quite publicly. So I was really uh, very, very inspired and very surprised and very delighted when I um, got in touch with them. So what I ended up doing was I ended up putting together a questionnaire, five simple questions, and I sent them to five of the monasteries. And I want to acknowledge right now that I didn't send them to any of the Asian American monasteries who have um, contributed hugely to the purity of the Dharma coming to the West. Um, I'm sure that there was a presentation all by itself that has to do with what they're doing as far as environmentally um, for America. And uh, But because my Western mind was sort of plugged into this, I want when I want when I want, and it's not a problem, it's not my, it's not a, my mistake, <laughs> that I wanted to just focus on the Westerners that I knew of that were living in community with these Asian traditions. And so I had five questions which I narrowed down to three. And I want to thank, um, before I kind of go through the synthesis of what I discovered, I wanted to thank uh, Bhante Rahula from Bhavana Forest Monastery. For, uh, I want to thank Reverend Master Daishan from Shasta, who took out a lot of, was really quite thoughtful in his responses. Venerable Sona from Birkin Forest Monastery, who sent me so much wonderful resource material. I was just so inspired by some of the things that he's written. Venerable Tarpa from Our Abbey, who has been the meticulous liaison for the building of the new monastic residence, and uh, Naniko Biku from Abayagiri, who took time out to respond to my questions. And so I wanted to sort of integrate, okay, the inner environment, these beautiful teachings that we have the fortune to practice 24-7 in our beautiful, rarefied environments in the country, in the woods, you know, with the songs of the coyotes and the birds. I mean, we're so lucky. And also to put them into, to sort of interface them with some real practical applications for these teachings in this field manual. So the first question that I asked was, what Buddhist principles or teachings has your monastery translated into environmental practices for ways of doing things within your daily community life in terms of your building structures, your use of resources, and the care of the land? And so everybody sent back their information. And I put them in, uh, sort of lined them up as far as how many responded. There was a constancy in the response of these. Um, The first one, without a doubt, was simplicity and the ethics of frugality. And each of the monasteries had different levels of which ones they addressed more directly, which ones they were working on. Um, 
the whole fuel shortage has really brought up into, I think, the, the focus for a lot of the monasteries because many of us are out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, for people to come and, and bring food offerings, they have to drive an hour and a half out of their way. And so uh, as far as carpooling and how much the monasteries really felt they needed to go into town um, and how they're trying to discipline the I want when I want when I want it kind of mind when it comes to projects at their monasteries and getting tools and going to doctors and running to the post office on how, like at Shravasta, you don't go to town unless you've got at least seven things on your list because it's, it's 22 miles round trip and it takes most of the day by the time you get things done. So that was one of the main ones as far as trying to keep the simple lifestyle with um, the necessities of keeping things going at the Abbey and taking care of each other at the same time. Um, all of them stringently recycle. I mean, this is, uh, and one of the things that I've really come to understand is that I think it gets a little bit trite in our culture, this whole thing about recycle and your, you know, composting bins and your newspapers and stuff. Everybody's like, yeah, whatever. But to be able to do this on a daily basis, mindfully, with care, and with respect for the environment is one of the most difficult practices, at least at our Abbey, is one of the most difficult and profound practices to do on a continual daily basis. And it makes a huge difference. I mean, our recycling has got to go to Seattle. Our, our you know, local landfill, bless their hearts, they take things like heavy metals <laughs> and refrigerators and toxic waste, but they don't take office paper and they don't take plastic. So we... we package this up of in large black bags, we put it in the barn, and one of our dear friends from Portland, Seattle, who have these wonderful recycling, you know, programs, they haul this stuff away in their vehicles. So we've got to be really, really mindful about how much stuff we're recycling, how the papers, you know, how the cardboard is getting broken down and how things are getting strapped together. And it seemed like it was something that Shasta recycles a lot of their painted wood, a lot of their building supplies. Um, Yard, you know, the, uh, the yard waste, the composting is really part of the process because that takes up huge amounts of landfill. People don't know that all that kitchen waste that was in that video the other night, that goes into the landfills where it could very easily just go back into the earth. Even if you don't garden, just put it out in a pile with some leaves. It'll take care of itself. Um, so the recycling was really um, stringently followed. Um, the other thing that was really wonderful to see is that the communities are really into reusing things. That whole thing about wait until it's just totally in shreds, wait until it no longer functions. And if it can't be repaired, it's recycled. The three R's definitely place itself out in the communities really uh, very, very stringently. Um, now, Reverend Master Dyson was really great because he says monastic communities have got to be fairly careful about this whole green snobbery that comes up as far as organic, not organic. Um, and we have learned at Shravasti Abbey that there is a way, and it has to be very, very skillful, and it has to be very, very gentle because there's, there's a balance. Here's this food. Here are these things freely offered, given from this, from this pure, pure space of the heart. And it's wrapped up in all this plastic. It's wrapped up in all this cardboard. By the time you take the food item out, it's like about this big, and it comes out of a box this big. And if we continue to just receive it, the consumerism, the whole environmental issue continues to just go on. And they don't even realize that this is going on. So how to be able, and we haven't quite figured out how to do this. Maybe we have some lay people in our community that may be able to communicate this rather than the monastics, is how to gently educate to say that our wish is part of our simple lifestyle is not to overconsume and to waste and to somehow be able to make suggestions, not only just to help our lifestyle, but also to support their lifestyle and also to re-educate them. So there's a fine balance of to receive what's offered and to eat only what's offered and at the same time to be able to educate and say, if we really want to survive this crisis, we've got to somehow work together and really, really honor the process here and really, really educate each other. So we're at the process right now trying to find out how to do this. And we know that it isn't going to be the monastics because we are the, the direct recipients of the food. But fortunately for us, we have lay residents of our community who are the ones who translate, who actually receive the food offerings and who by our generosity get to share in the abundance. And they may be sort of the mediators between this little bridge that needs to be crossed. Um, bottled water is out. 
You know, the, the, the manufacturing process of bottled water. And besides, most of us have this delicious water that comes out of the well. So the bottled water is gone. Plastic and paper bags, we've got huge amounts of cloth grocery bags that our volunteers who, who offer food to us. They come in these beautiful, big canvas satchels that get passed around for whichever community is going to be offering food for the next week. Um, the issue of how to take care of large groups that come, I think styrofoam and plastic plates and cups is a huge issue. Um, we don't have it. We do the, the same thing that the Reformed Church does. We get together all these ceramic cups that people don't use anymore, and we use ceramic and we use old chip dishes to feed. But, of course, our numbers are still only at the two, three dozen mark. We're not feeding 100, 200, 300 people. So that's an issue that I think some of the folks in your communities, that if, you have, if you're feeding that kind of guest numbers is what type of creative options that we can really reuse to get out of the styrofoam and plastic, which is going to be here until all of us become Buddhas. So, you know, we <laughs> do something about this. Um, also, what was wonderful to see is that we're really, really prudent with our finances. Um, there's a, the community has a lot to say, and if they don't handle money directly, the people who do handle your money, there's, the monastics have something to say about how the money is spent. Uh, personal possessions, there's a continual paring down. Um, and that is, that is part of the, the, the practice. I know that when I first came to the Abbey, I had a lot more stuff than I have now. Once you ordain, there's sort of a purge. And then maybe once you go through another stage of ordination, there's another purge. I mean, there's, I think there's sort of a system. We have this large barn that sort of traps all the personal possessions that we're not ready to get rid of yet, but Venerable goes up there every once in a while and goes, all right, whose suitcase, whose box is this? We have to revisit this box. Um, and then we have volunteers, and uh, Shasta Abbey has the same um, thing, is that their volunteers do these garage sales, where a lot of the abundance or the things that can be still used, but maybe the, the Abbeys can no longer uh, use, is that they go into these garage sales, the volunteers hold these garage sales, and all the proceeds come back to the Abbey which I think is one of the most wonderful acts of generosity that volunteers um, really, really do donate to the monasteries is they pass, we pass the things around rather than going to the store and buying things new. And they, they have raised a lot of money. I have a feeling that the folks at Shasta have also been quite, uh, quite successful in the garage sales. I remember when I was <laughs> at Shasta this December, we had this beautiful blessing of the property, and Reverend Master Echo was going with his incense and the chant and going through each of the storage facilities. And at the end of the day, he said, you know, we really need to tear down. We've got all this stuff in these storage closets. Maybe, you know, let's, let's rethink this and, and go through them again. So there's this continually, you know, replacement reuse and how we can keep continually paring down. Um, uh, the other thing that was really, that's a really beautiful practice, environmental practice, um, and a spiritual practice, which I also witnessed at, at Shasta, and we do it at Shravasti, is that during the, when I was there, it was holiday season, and their late congregation, as part of the holiday season, made an offering of food and goods to the Abbey. And so we, what we did is we all joined in in the ceremonial hall, and all of the gifts were around the bottom of the altar, and the lay people lined up in rows on either side of Reverend Master Echo was in the center. And each one of them took a gift and they handed it to each other. Because in, t in Buddhism, if you give a gift to the three jewels, you accumulate vast skies of merit. So although you only gave one, made one offering, because you got to handle 75 of them, by the time it got to Reverend Master Echo, who then offered it to the triple gem before it came to the community, there was, you could feel the accumulation of merit in the room as this was happening. <laughs> These little, little kids, these people in wheelchairs with canes, everybody just gently, patiently, joyfully just passing these gifts. And this is part of the, the offering to the Sangha, you know, eating and, and really taking in only what's offered. So I was a uh, witness to it. It was really a very, very inspiring uh, experience. The second one is, um, and this is one that's very, very near and dear to my heart, is the practice of harmlessness, harmlessness and protecting life. This one runs really very, very much consistent through the, the communities and the Buddhist tradition. Um, bhavana, who have snakes on their property, have been really coming up with creative, they say creative and non-harmful ways to relocate them. Mm -hmm. Because not only do you have to deal with you know, protecting the life, but you've also got to take into consideration the safety and the health of the community. 
So if you've got poisonous snakes and rats and biting poisonous spiders in your on your property, there's somehow to be able to live with them but safely relocate them so that the community is safe, that you don't have all of these hospital emergencies because there's, or your guests, uh, people who are allergic <laughs> to bee, bee stings and wasps, you know, trying to be very, very careful about relocating them. Rattlesnakes, yeah. And um, the other was, um, is this um, is this cultural embedding that we've had ever since we were children, is this practice, in Buddhism it's called equanimity. But what our culture has done is that it has separated the animal kingdom into those that are enemies and those that are friends. There's friend, enemy, and stranger. And in the animal kingdom, as far as our culture is concerned, there are definitely friends. The ladybug, the hummingbird, the butterfly, you know, the hawk. And then there are definitely the enemies, the ticks, the fleas, the mosquitoes, the, the things that sting, the things that bite, the things that, you know, run around on your floor and make things just, you know, what you think is unsanitary. So the relationship to the animal world, um, I can see that in, the, in our communities, is really, is really turning around and it's a, it's a reconditioning of the mind and there's a relationship that is really, really evolving because when you get into living with these little beings and you see their life cycles and you see that the only thing that they have is that very, very precious, very, very short at times life, the last thing you want to do is stop that in its tracks. And so you, the whole community becomes aware. And in our tradition, if you meet up with one who's either living, dying, or dead, Blowing mantra on them sets really, really powerful imprints in their minds to perhaps sometime in a future life they will be able to have a precious human rebirth. So all of the monasteries are really, uh, Birkin has a bird sanctuary, and so they leave things very, very, you know, leave it as it, leave it, as it lies. Um, and, you know, birds, a lot of the birds, they like things that humans don't like, which is like cluttered you know, forests and things that are decomposing and things that are rotting and things that are all covered with vines and thorns. They just love that stuff. And so from what I could gather at uh, Venerable Sona's monastery, they keep their bird sanctuary very, very undisturbed. And if humans want to go visit it, then, <laughs> you know, take your time and be careful, but we're not going to change things. Um, and the other thing as part of the, the harmlessness is the practice of vegetarianism. And for some of the monasteries, there's even ve- veganism at this point. Many of the monastics have totally even given up the, the eggs, the dairy, and the honey. And, um, you know, as far as, the, as the, uh, this, the, the, the video the other night with the Ramadan, which, you know, I think in some spiritual traditions, that is probably a beautiful sacred practice. But as far as me looking at those chickens on that organic farm and me looking into that cow's eyes, I don't see what the Muslims see. No, I look at the cows in our fields down below and I look into their eyes and I see a sentient being trapped in suffering that has no idea of the Dharma, has no idea what is going to happen. I don't see, you know, whether you, you know, kiss it and pet it and give it shampoos, you're still going to slaughter it. And the most precious thing that they have is their lives. And I don't want that karma on my mind. And so the, the practice of vegetarianism in many of the monastic communities, is just, it's part of our, you know, our um, discipline. It's part of keeping things simple. And it's also the practice of non-harmfulness. And where you are in your communities, I'm sure that it varies. That spiritual traditions see things very, very differently. But as far as the Buddha is concerned, every sentient being is worth the same amount has, as, as Reverend Master Echo says, has Buddha nature at its very, very core. And it is not up to us to determine, you know, who gets eaten, who doesn't get eaten. Um, and then the third one is uh, the stewardship of the land. And what was really exciting and inspiring is that the Buddhist monasteries, there's a, there's a long-term thinking you know, you get out of the economics, you get out of the commodity value of your property, you can really start looking at it in a really, really long-term thinking. Um, many of them really aspire to just really bring the land back. You know, some of them are like um, Shravasti Abbey. We've gone back to a land that was heavily logged 25 years ago. And so there's these aspirations to really either restore the property back to the way that it was 
or at least if that's unable to do that, is to keep it healthy so that it can sustain itself. Um, some of the monasteries keep the land pretty much undisturbed. They let the fallen and the decay lie. Um, other ones, because of the forest health, they need to chainsaw and thin and keep the forest healthy. Um, Bhavana has got an interesting situation going on right now, is that Allegheny Power uh, wants to build a new 200-foot-wide right-of-way right of through a forest adjacent to their property for some high power lines. And because the forest tradition, like the, the whole fundamental base, is this beautiful green gem of a forest that you get to live in and you get to uh, share with those who want to come and be in solitude. And to have a high transmission line vibrating and pulsating on the property next door to you would totally you know, null and void that whole experience. But what they've done, which is, which is really part of their practice, and Banta Rahula sent me some of the articles, is that they've gone to court with this, with a number of local groups. And the way in which they ex not only explain the reason why they opposed it, which they're finding out is, may not even be necessary, is that they also offered some very creative, innovative ways to deal with it. So sometimes when you deal with the outside world and, and they're sort of imposing things that may really, really jeopardize the, the monastic environment, if you can come up with creative and innovative ways to sort of counteract or give them in response, they actually think about it. And that's what the power company is doing right now, is that there was an old right-of-way down the road that's already clear-cut. <coughs> so acres of land wouldn't have to be clear-cut. And that there's a way to double stack these high power lines, which takes up about a quarter, a third of the space that they would if they laid them the way that they planned. Mm -hmm. So right now, I think the end of this month, they're going to decide on what they're going to do here. So we've been sending a lot of prayers to Bhavana Forest Monastery to make sure that this happens for them and for the welfare of everybody. You know. um, and then the other thing um, is that living in a, um, a part of the world where there's a lot of uh, logging and lumber is the main industry where we are. The lumber companies um, have fed and clothed and have you know, really kept the economy of our part of the world very much alive. And as much as we can appreciate and really, really honor their kindness, they've also kind of run, you know, run amok. They have taken over right-of-ways and easements on people's titles for like $10 30 years ago, and they come in whenever they want. They do these progressive forestry is still somewhat of a, uh, what is that word, uh, paradox? Uh, oxymoron. oxymoron. Progressive logging. Um, and so they, they come in and they send you these really beautiful flowery, letters that say we will do all of this and by the way we're going to want to use that we have an easement on our in our deed that gives Boise Cascade who is now Forest Capital until perpetuity for ten dollars oh. right of way into these landlocked beautiful pieces of property that they log every 25 or 30 years so um, that one which we're going to be dealing with this summer but when other logging companies found out about that they thought Let's use this. We'll just go and ask the Abbey. They're nice Buddhist people. They're going to say, of course, come in. We'll, you know, everything will be fine. But the sound of logging trucks for a year and a half, day in and day out, from 3 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night, somewhat affects the solitude and the contemplative atmosphere of an Abbey. So, and they dangle a, a rather large carrot that says that we would be compensated and we could pretty much, you know, name whatever our number was. And we'd had a lot of legal counsel on what we could actually ask for, which was quite a bit of money. But we said no, and we wrote them a really, really uh, clear letter without a lot of anger and a lot of, you know, guilt and things like that, and just said, you know, we've really thought about this, and according to our bylaws, this is not part of what we really, really can have happen for the long-term health of our community. And we had heard that they had another option across the hill that was more expensive, <laughs> a little bit more tedious. And the other thing that was also going to happen is that they were going to log a mountain which involves skyline logging, which is you take helicopters, you plant these large towers on the hill with these cables running, and you cut down the trees and you slide them down the hill to the trucks. The erosion that comes as a result of this type of logging that they say makes less impact than getting the trucks up there is also uh, an oxymoron. <coughs> and we just felt as far as the long-term environment, once again, not just our own stewardship, but the interdependence of all the other you know, ecosystems around us, that we had some uh, power here to be able to make a determination. And so we decided not to, and that was kind of the end of it. We've since had another company who's asked, and 
that was not such a pleasant scene, but uh, we had to stand our ground. Um, and then the last of, of this non-harmfulness is what we have in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. It's part of the Bodhisattva path. It's animal liberation, which is a beautiful practice, is that if there's some way to safely, and if the animals are of your own region, if there's some way to collect all the earthworms, all the worms in the tackle shop, who were you know, dug in the midnight hours of the land around you as you go to the tackle shop and you, you take these hundreds of thousands of worms and you liberate them with this beautiful practice back into the, world, into the earth. Um, or you can, as we did at the Abbey, is that the people down the street from us had a mother sheep and baby lambs that they were going to slaughter. And part of the Bodhisattva practice is if you can at any time prevent the killing of another living being, you do so. And so what we did... And we couldn't come out and say, Michael, <laughs> your behavior is appalling. You're going to create a whole bunch of negative karma because he's a Jehovah's Witness. You can't, you can't say those things to me. But, what, but we've also had become quite fond of them, you know, the mom and seeing the babies playing. And so we told them that we had, you know, it was, it was true, is that we'd become very, very attached to them and that we really wanted very, very much to, to buy them. And would he consider us compensating him for them in the form of money so that he could go and if he needed to buy meat, that he could buy meat, but that we would really, really love to to take the, to buy them. And he not only said yes, but he also kept them for the winter. We paid for all of their feed, all of their grain. We visited them every day. And during the winter, in the middle of a winter retreat, I found a vegetarian organic gardening shepherdess who happened to be looking for three sheep. <laughs> and so Trinley and Jigme and Karuna went to Ellen in the spring. Michael helped her put them into the trucks, and we haven't seen any sheep on the property since then. But I think it was not only a teaching for us that that does the Bodhisattva vows do work, and I think it was probably an interesting experience for Michael and Sally, because at no time do we ever say that they were an enemy. At no time do we ever say that there was some sort of fault, some sort of sin going on but that you know, the skillful means of the bodhisattva practice requires this kind of wisdom and compassion at the same time. And then, um, and then the fourth one of this one is um, the necessity of solitary and silent retreats. <coughs> Once again, all the monasteries really, really trying to cultivate. The monastery is busy. We need to find time. We need to find space so that our uh, community members can do silent <coughs> and solitary retreat to really feed and sort of nourish this inner ecosystem that tends to get a little torn a little weary around the edges sometimes. And so it looked like all of the monasteries. Uh, Shasta's got some beautiful hermitages. Uh, the Kutis themselves at Bhavana and Abai Gir, I'm sure you know, the community can really take advantage of that. And we have a three-month silent retreat at the Abbey. Um, and then um, finding out about the solar energy of uh, Birkin and Abai Gir was a really, really exciting experience for me. I had no idea. I'm so off the grid at this point because my nose has been so into just training, behaving myself. I didn't even know that Abai Giri has had for a number of years. I had to go through your Fearless Mountain newsletters for, I think, about three years to find the actual project because one of the issues or one of the questions I have is how public, you know, how do we celebrate these things to let the public know that this monastery that's living the life of simplicity is doing some very innovative thinking to sort of interface that simplicity with technology. So you have this beautiful system that's in place. You're selling electricity back to the power company, and most of the world doesn't know. So where, where can we somehow find a forum for that to be shared? And then, I mean, Venerable Sona is just like an ever, ever ready bunny in his efforts to make uh, Birkin an, an off-the-grid kind of abbey to where it's self-sustaining and that the electricity, they still get propane, they have a wood boiler that does a lot of the heating. There's still One of the things about alternative technology that I have come to the conclusion is the reason that it's still expensive and that a lot of the world still can't afford it is because we're still asking it to feed our overconsumption. You know, how many, how many, whatever that big number is that those towers can bring in, we still want Mother Nature to come up with the goods. And I think that's why it's still expensive, and I think that's still why it's still, for most people who have middle incomes that want to change their lives, they can't do it. For us, luckily, and for Abaya Giri, they actually had a donation of over $100,000, which is how they got their, their system in. And so, you know, the, the powering down supports alternative technology. 
And so the part of, I think, our environmental practice is somehow to be able to share what we've succeeded at, our endeavors, so that the public sees that by powering down rather than trying to replace, alternative technologies work really, really well. I mean, hydroelectric kind of, I think it's one of the most ruthless technologies. I mean, when I see these pictures of these dams, it looks like we just shoved something down Mother Nature's mouth and we're holding it in there for her to just kind of gag on it until we decide to remove them. Um, so I'm on my, off my soapbox. Uh, and then Shravasti Abbey is using some geothermal heating systems for their new monastic residents, which is really exciting, using the earth to heat and cool our environment. And it, uh, from what we've heard, is going to save a lot on electricity, which in our part of the world is very, very inexpensive. Our major, our electricity is subsidized by a paper mill in our community that has some of the most advanced technology. It is employee-run and governed, and it subsidizes all the local communities, so they pay for a lot of our electricity. But we still don't want to go there because someday they may not be able to do that, and we just want to be prepared. Um, the second question was what individual or group patterns or ways of thinking have been the most challenging for the community to change in its efforts to live with the Buddha taught in regards to the land and the beings that live there. And I'll go through this really, really quickly. And the, sum, the summation was is that the most difficult challenge is the conditioned consumer habits. And as our communities, uh, most of the people who are coming to the communities are older. That seems to be across the board with few exceptions. 40s and 50s, the conditioned cultural habits of how we use things, how we recycle things, how we walk in the world is very much conditioned. So for the, the abbots where they becomes quite... Um, tedious to re <laughs> to talk this over and over again with the communities is that the conditioned habitual patterns of, of slipping into the old ways of uh, complacency and mindlessness and things like that is probably one of the most challenging and it's something that continually needs to be revisited as far as the monasteries are um, dealing with um, I think it was uh, Venerable Sona who said it was difficult to persuade residents and donors on the ethics of frugality that the donors kill us with kindness, offering us processed food, bottled waters, and electrical gadgets that we really, you know, don't need. And, um, and so as far as, um, I want to close here very, very quickly, is that the role that the environmental movement, and this is where my question goes, is what role in the environmental movement do you see your community play? in inspiring and in influencing the lay public at the grassroots level as well as the larger connection through writings, internet, and teachings. Um, I think we've got a lot of information. I think we have a lot of experience. If it's not just the simple recycling, taking care in that way, or the alternative technologies. What is the forum? What is the level of the outreach? How public do we go? Because there's a lot of enthusiasm. There's a lot of inspiration in what we're doing. So how do we, as uh, monastics, where do we go from here? And uh, we're well-educated, not very outspoken. We can hold um, retreats for tired-out, compassion-fatigued uh, environmentalists. We can hold Green Monday discussions between lay and monastics where we, sh where we share our insights and our in successes. Um, and that our life as example for the lay community is probably the most powerful one. So where do we go? How do we share the field manual? How do, we how do we share the manifestation of that field manual in our outer environments so that this whole powering down of our culture can happen in a really graceful, a really compassionate, but in a somewhat forward-moving direction? So anyway, thank you very much for your time and attention.